In the heart of Sheffield is an organisation who've been on an incredible journey over more than 10 years in their unrelenting desire to support some of the most vulnerable people in our society. Their story began with the shared vision of two dedicated and inspirational women, Lara Bundock and Rachel Medina, but along the way, through many ups and downs, the kindness and generosity of others has been a consistent and invaluable part of their story, and at times has been the reason that the story has continued to be written. We had the pleasure of spending time with Lara and Rachel at their offices, and they were kind enough to give us an insight into parts of their journey, and amazing examples of how it really does take a village to create something life-changing. This is a journey of kindness. Back in 2011, Lara, who'd come from a background as a social worker, was working in a safe house supporting victims of human trafficking when she quickly realised there were problems with the system. One of the major issues was that the people I was supporting in the safe house, they were given 45 days to be supported after they'd been rescued. And then at the end of that 45 days, I, as the kind of support worker and the social worker, had to essentially kick them out of the safe house and then there was no follow-on support, there was no nothing. And and like it doesn't take a genius to work out what's gonna happen at that point when somebody's been through a lot of trauma and they've only had 45 days of support. I just kind of thought, well, this doesn't make any sense. This is like ethically, morally, professionally, like everything, this is just wrong. Um, and I'm, I'm not the kind of person who sits still very easily. <laughs> Lara felt so strongly about the lack of support that was available, she spent her spare time developing an idea of what support was really needed. I pitched it to my work and my work said, we think this is great, we think you need to do this, this is a really good idea, um, we're not going to support you doing it. I was like, cool, cheers. <laughs> um, but one of the women who was really, like, I'm glad she said this to me, she said, I think if you can find one other person to do this with, then you should do this. As fate would have it, her friend Rachel, who had a background in working with and supporting refugees and migrants was going through some life changes. I had been previously employed working on a refugee support project. My job with there was ending. I was, um, our funding had ended. I was being made redundant. I was also pregnant. And so as we were talking, I was like, I think I might have some skills that would help with this. Can I, can I help? I'm really excited about this. As they started working together to develop and define plans of how to train support volunteers, the first serendipitous moment came about when Lara was speaking at Sheffield Hallam University. They knew my name from working in the safe house yeah. and they were basically like, oh, could you get up at the end and just like talk for like 10 minutes? And so I just got up and I kind of talked about what I did in, in the safe house, but we were just at the process of launching Snowdrop and so I was kind of like, well, I'm going to throw this in. And in the audience was a guy who worked for Erwin Mitchells, a massive legal agency. Didn't know that. He was like, oh, you should meet my boss. And I was and, like, turned up into this massively plush building and this guy like grilled me on what we were doing. And then he was like, great, that sounds good. Well, we will give you like free printing resources and we'll give you free training rooms and we'll do this and this. And I was like, sorry, what do you want from me? <laughs> and he was like, nothing, you're doing a good thing. That's what we do. Through their hard work and determination, alongside the help and support of others, it wasn't long before the vision started to become reality. I went off to have my baby in December of 2012, but <laughs> you guys had, we had 10 trained up, passionate volunteers yeah. who were able to take on cases. They were also starting to gain recognition and support from Parliament. There were visits to Westminster and they were part of important conversations, which led to them co-authoring a report entitled Life Beyond the Safe House. The next step in the journey was to become a registered charity, and this was not without its problems. We got to this point where we were going to have a conversation with Erwin Mitchell about finances because they, our seed money was gone. And we had this really amazing moment with these two solicitors who'd been supporting us. And, uh, and they said, just so you know, we're surprised by how long this is taking, but we don't want to give up. We really believe in what you're doing and we want to give our time to seeing this through so you guys get charity status. And we were absolutely blown away by that support and the, the faith that they had in us. Despite the strong desire to carry on, there were times where the challenge felt insurmountable, but people's kindness continued to give them the power to keep going. Our first ever regular donor um, was an 11 year old girl. We went and did a talk at a youth group and she apparently went home 
and, and was basically like, I can't believe that there are people in the world who go through these kind of things and I want to give some of my pocket money. And so she started by giving £2.50 a month. And that was another one of those like points where I was like, I don't know if I can keep going. I don't know if I can keep, keep this up. We have no money. And then this like regular donation of £2.50 a month starts coming in. And I'm like, OK, if an 11 year old girl can give £2.50 a month, I can keep going. That's I can I can do this. They carried on and further to some successful fundraising after years of working from wherever they could, including a room under the stairs in a local church, they decided to lease their first office space. We'd had bits of like money come in and we got enough to rent our own offices. Yep. And so that was a big step. We rented our first offices. We didn't have furniture, we couldn't afford furniture. And um, somebody came running in when we opened the office to be like, hey, the office over the road is chucking out furniture. Do you guys need any? And we were like, yep. <laughs> like ran over and these removal guys. And I, I was like, can I, what are you doing with these? And they were like, oh, we're just getting rid of them. I was like, can we have them? So they gave me some stickers and went, okay, run in the building, stick stickers on the things you want. We will carry them over and then that's it. And they were like, Is, I said, do you want anything for this? We don't really have any money, but would you like anything? And these guys went, bacon sandwich. I was like, I can do that. I can definitely do that. I can, I can definitely get you bacon sandwiches. And so we always laughed that we furnished our offices from eight bacon sandwiches. By mid-2015, after years of fighting challenges and working for very little, they realised that, as it was, the charity and the way they were working was not sustainable. On the 31st of August, they made a big decision to give Snaydrop one more year to become more sustainable or they would have to stop. We both decided we would go for big lottery funding. I mean, we lay on the floor of the office after we sent in our submission. Like, that is the hardest piece of work we have currently at that point done. <laughs> and um, we were just, we were kind of like, wow, okay, either this is gonna turn us into like a fully running charity or we're gonna close. And we, just, we really believed in what we were doing, but we had to also to kind of take into consideration our own well-being at that yeah. point. The money for funding came in on the 31st of August 2016, came into the bank account. When the guy called us to say, we've we've decided to give you funding, he was like, just so you know, we don't do this. Um, we don't give organisations that have never had funding for <laughs> this amount of money. But he said, what you've achieved on nothing is so impressive that we now want to see what you can do with money. Yeah. Since then, they've gone from strength to strength, offering more services, taking on more staff, buying their own permanent office home, but ultimately supporting more and more survivors. Both Lara and Rachel are very clear on what has been the critical part of this journey. I don't think either of us could have achieved anything like what we've achieved without all of the, all of the people mm -hmm. who got behind it. Yeah. And that's one of the really quite humbling things about, I feel like, Snowdrop's journey. Yeah. All of the staff that we have taken on are just the most incredible humans that you can meet who are so passionate and so talented at what they do. And I, I, every time we hire people, I'm just like, how do we find these people that are mm -hmm. absolutely incredible at what they can achieve and, and, and how they work in, in their position? The people who come on board and whether they've run a fundraiser for us or whether they've given to us or whether they've given their time because they couldn't give money or they've created things for us or you know whatever it might be just all of those people like I see that as that is Snowdrop that is who we are it's mm -hmm. just a, a momentum of people who believed in a vision and and gone after it in whatever way people were able to do and that for me is is the, the most fabulous thing about Snowdrop is is that momentum that it's it's created. If you'd like to find out more about the work that Lara, Rachel and the Snowdrop team do and maybe even become part of their story yourself, please visit their website. Thank you so much Lara and Rachel for taking the time to share your incredible journey with us. <laughs>